Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today. So let me start going back in time, actually, and we are in the early 90s. And back then, the only planets we knew were the planets around the Rome star, the Sun. And you can see our Earth is, is down here. It's one of the rocky planets with Venus and Mars and Mercury. And then this big planet here is Jupiter, one, uh, 300 times the mass of the Earth. Saturn, 100 times the mass of the Earth. And then we have the icy giants, Uranus and Neptune, that are about 15 times the mass of the Earth. This is what we knew in the 90s. But then, actually, what we have discovered in the past 20 years or so is that, on average, every star in our galaxy is expected to have at least one planet in orbit, which is incredible because we're talking about billions of stars in our own galaxy, the Milky Way alone. And our galaxy is one of the billions of galaxies in the universe. So you do the math and you understand how many planets are probably out there. I'm afraid we don't know yet this billion of billions of planets, but how we're counting for the moment in the past 20 years is about 4,000 exosolar planets. So we're talking about exosolar planets, meaning planets orbiting our stars, not our own sun, different stars, the stars that you see in the sky at night, most of the stars do have planets in orbit. And so what is also quite extraordinary, in this graph here, you have the year of discovery, and now we're here. And you see from the 90s, really the number of planets discovered uh, have increased exponentially, and uh, it, it keeps growing. Now, we don't know so much yet about most of these planets that we have uh, discovered. For many of them, we know the dimension, the size, how big they are. So if they are as big as Jupiter or smaller, uh, like the other planets in the solar system, we know for many of them the mass, so how much they weigh. And from the fact that we know how far they are from their own star, we can estimate the temperature uh, at the surface, if there is a surface of those planets, because the star is clearly the source of energy, and so the closer you are to the star, the hotter you are, the far away you are, the colder you are. So we still don't know too much, but even with those very basic parameters, we're seeing an incredible diversity of planets in the galaxy. Many of those planets do not resemble at all the planets that we have in our own solar system. And in particular, we have discovered that the most common planets out there are these planets that we call super-Earths, which are planets with the mass in between the mass of the Earth and the mass of Neptune, and they're probably some sort of hybrid planets we don't know too much about. But to show you how much diversity we're expecting, I'm going to show you a few science fiction movie images. And let me start with this one. Uh, who has seen the movie Interstellar here? Yeah, many of you. So clearly you might remember this image about a water world. And actually we're expecting that many of the super Earths might resemble this water world here because the density is suggestive of an interior that is probably made of ice and the temperature might suggest that, that most of this ice is actually molten at the surface, so probably with some oceans. This Kepler-22b planets could be an example of water world. Um, again, from Interstellar, you might remember this, this small frozen planet. Uh, most of the planets that have been discovered through the technique of microlensing are very, very far away from the star, and so they're very cold, and so presumably they might look like this particular planet here. Again, from, solar, uh, from uh, science fiction, from the movie Star Wars, uh, you might remember these lava worlds. We know today that there are many of the super Earths that are orbiting so close to the star that they basically complete one entire orbit, in some cases, in less than one day. So can you imagine, for the Earth to complete one orbit around the Sun is 365 days, roughly. So here, to complete an orbit in less than one day, you're literally close, close to the, uh, the star. And so the temperature at the surface for this planet goes beyond 2,000 degrees. So it's incredibly hot, and the surface that is uh, probably made of, uh, of rock is, is molten. And so that's why we are calling them lava words. And so this Coro 7b, for instance, is one of the examples that I have in mind. Again, from Star Wars, uh, you might remember these uh, planets that are orbiting around uh, binary stars, and so planets for which you have uh, two sunset, two dawns, uh, which is quite incredible and exotic to think about it. Now, we know, thanks to the Kepler mission, the NASA Kepler mission that was launched uh, in 2009, that there is a long list of planets around these uh, um, binary stars. We call them circumbinary planets. And so again, it's no longer really science fiction, it's reality. 
And again, this is the last slide about uh, the connection with science fiction. But of course, you might remember the movie Avatar and the fact that uh, in the movie there was this uh, very interesting exomoon. Now, the hunt for exomoon is ongoing, and there is already an exomoon candidate since last year. So clearly, uh, we're looking forward to see many more moons in the future. OK. Back to real science. Um, I told you that we already know 4,000 planets and they're very diverse, but actually it will be in the next decade that we can really make a leap in our understanding of all these planets. To start with, we have a, a series of space missions that are already either flying or about to be launched by NASA and the European Space Mission that will deliver even more planets in the next decade. And so in particular, there is the NASA TESS mission that is already flying or the European Space Agency Gaia mission. And both of them are expected to deliver thousands of new extrasolar planets. And the, the, the Kiyo space mission is about to be launched by ESA. And later into the future, the Plato mission in 2026, again, will deliver even more planets. But of course, we also want to understand not just about uh, uh, how many planets we have in the galaxy, we also want to understand their nature. And in particular today, I will talk about a few of the mission observatories uh, that will be launched uh, uh, very soon in order to understand uh, uh, many of the characteristics of these planets. And in particular, we'll talk a little bit about Ariel and about the James Webb Space Telescope. So I was mentioning that we really want to try to understand the nature of these planets. And we have a series of questions that we want to be able to address in the next decade as scientists, but also as human beings, because ultimately we're all interested in this. And in particular, we want to understand what our exoplanet made of, what is the bulk composition, what kind of chemistry is there, but also what's the weather like there, what's the climate, how these planets are forming, why we're seeing all this big diversity in the galaxy that we're not necessarily seeing our own solar system. And ultimately, of course, we're also interested about visibility, understanding whether some of these planets are habitable or not. So, so far, we have been able, at least for a, a few tens of planets, which are very big, as big as our own Jupiter, to find out some of the uh, most abundant uh, molecules that are present in their atmosphere. And in particular, we are focused on uh, giant planets as big as Jupiter, and these planets are mainly made of molecular hydrogen. But then what we have found out with current space telescope, in particular like Spitzer and the Hubble Space Telescope, that most of these planets do contain, for instance, water vapor in their atmosphere. And so for the moment, uh, we know that water vapor is present for a few tons of these planets. And of course, we want to understand better these planets and understand whether there are other molecules molecules, uh, a more complex chemistry, but I also want to understand also smaller planets and colder ones, so get to the regime of the super-Earth. And with current instrumentation, it's very difficult. We have a few <coughs> observations, but are not really very conclusive, and so we really need to wait for the next generation. And talking about the next generation, uh, the aerial space mission has been selected by the European Space Agency last year to be the next the medium-sized mission to be launched in 2028 on the principal investigator of Ariel. So I'm very, very happy that Ariel is going to happen. What is Ariel? Ariel is a one meter telescope that will be sent in a location called L2, which is 1.5 million kilometers away from the Earth. So here you have the sun, here you have the Earth, and L2 is here. And from that position, we will look at the atmospheric composition and structure of about 1,000 extrasolar planets. And so we will try to understand what is the nature of this planet, um, what is the chemistry, what is the temperature, and really find out about what's going on in those faraway planets. Area will be built by a consortium of 17 countries that are part of ESA, and a NASA contribution is under study. And it will be integrated, tested on very high, here in the UK, in the Harvard campus in Dickert at Royal Space. So we are very fortunate that we'll see basically this uh, instrumentation coming up, being assembled here and verified here. If you're interested in more in habitable worlds, then probably the first opportunity we will have is to look at uh, small planets, rocky type, around a very cold star. 
And the reason why we want to focus initially in those one is because, well, first of all, coal star uh, are much more numerous um, in, in our solar neighborhood. But on top of that, typically planets, uh, um, since the, the star is colder, uh, the planet that we are discovering right now are also relatively cold. And uh, um, since they're cold and so, so close to the star, they are also easier to observe. And so in a few years' time, there is this uh, big observatory called the James, um, James Webb Space Mission uh, that will be launched uh, by a collaboration uh, between NASA and ESA. And James Webb will be able to look at the atmosphere of these smaller and colder planets. And so potentially, this is our first opportunity to look at habitable worlds in just a few years' time. We're talking about not the twin of the Earth. We're talking about the cousins. But of course, it's very, very exciting to start to see planets which are more similar to ours. And in the meantime, here in London, we're also working at uh, the design and construction of a small satellite that is called Twinkle. And the plan is to launch Twinkle, which is uh, as big as a dishwasher, more or less. It will be launched in low orbit. Uh, the plan is to do that in 2022. We're working with Airbus and our space industry in order to make sure that it's happening. And among many things, Twinkle will be able to look at exosolar planets, in particular the most favorable one, and start to tell us about their nature. And if you want to know more, again, this is a, a, an address of YouTube where you can see what the mission is able to do. So if you're interested in participating in this great adventure, there is plenty of opportunity for anybody at any age. And in particular, we have many educational programs connecting to many of these missions. Uh, one program that is uh, currently extremely successful is called Orbits. And basically, it's coupling high school students in the area of London with PhD students from the University of London to do original research. And we have already a number of science papers that have been uh, published in peer-reviewed journals as part of this program, which is extremely successful. So Orbitz is, is clearly something that is growing and is going very well. Um, but uh, if you're interested in machine learning or AI, which clearly are very trendy uh, words in the current society, both from a professional but also amateurial way, we have some data challenges. Um, the aerial data challenges that are um, available, anybody can participate to that. And we have at the moment 100 groups that are participating to this competition. The competition will be closed in mid-August and the winners um, will be able to go to the European Conference on Machine Learning. So again, it's another opportunity where anybody really can participate. And uh, finally, if you're interested in observations, if you have a telescope in your backyard and you like to look at stars, uh, then of course you can help us in particular to find the very best planets to look at for aerial. We need to select 1,000 planets in 10 years' time uh, among the many that will be discovered at that point. And we need the help of everybody to keep monitoring the star and the planet through time and understand a little bit better um, um, the characteristic of the star, the position of the planet. And again, uh, amateur um, astronomers will have the possibility of understanding through our website what are the targets that are visible in that week, in that month, in that year, and really help us with this program. I believe my time is about to be over, so let me wrap up to conclusion here. What we have learned in the past 20 years is that on average, every star in our galaxy uh, has a planet, which is incredible because it means respecting billions of billions of planets in our own universe. And we have all this question that we really want to try to understand as scientists, as human beings, what are they made of? What's their nature? What's the weather? What's the climate there? How they form? Why they're so diverse? How are they habitable? And my conclusion is stay tuned because the adventures are really just started. Thank you very much. We uh, do have some time for questions for Professor Tinetti. In terms of the habitability question, how important is the magnetic field and the Van Allen belt kind of thing as part of that decision? Uh, it's, it's a great question. Um, of course, on Earth, uh, we are lucky because there is a magnetic field that is protecting us uh, from the radiation from the star and is also helping us retain in an atmosphere through time. And so we believe the magnetic field is very important. But so far, it has been very hard, actually, to measure directly the magnetic field of all these planets. And so um, it, it might need to... to 
to wait a few more years where uh, big missions like Athena or uh, um, service from the ground like SKIA will be online and possibly some of those measurements will help us understanding whether there is a magnetic field or not. Today we still don't know about most of this plan and what is the situation with the magnetic field. But you're right, it, it, it's such an element that needs to be considered. Thank you. You were talking about uh, uh, your focus on, on planets around stars which have got lower temperatures. When you were talking about that, is our sun a lower temperature star or where does it sit in that? In that spectrum. That's a very good question. Um, our sun is a sort of an average, and so we're talking about a temperature for the sun around uh, 5,800 Kelvin. Uh, most of the star I was referring to as relatively cold star, typically around 3,000 Kelvin or so. So we're talking about stars which are much cooler and smaller compared to our own sun. But they, they have some disadvantages, and one disadvantage is they're very active, and so in particular, uh, uh, it's connected to the other question. Of course, if they are so active, you don't want to have all these flares coming from the star on your planet um, if, if you want to look at life. Um, on the other hand, they are very common, these stars, uh, and um, um, they also have a very long life. And so they, in that sense, they can provide perhaps a, a good host uh, to have planets around them. The bigger is the star, the more unstable it is. Um, because when you, when you use a telescope, um, it isn't accurate because if you go really far, um, light, um, because there's light years, you'll just see the planet in the, um, in, the, in the past or the future, on the past usually. Um, so um, will that same effect be sent by, by the, tels by the um, missions to space when they send it back, but instead you'll see the planet by the future? And then if it, will it be accurate? Because obviously if there was a water planet, then the water planet, um, um, if there was just a young sun, then the water planet would be able to have water. But when the sun grows older, the, wa the water would evaporate before it was sitting around and it wouldn't be habitable anymore. That's absolutely a great question. Uh, can we hire you in 10 years' time <laughs> to help us with the mission? It's absolutely a great question. And you're absolutely right that the far away you go, and then in a certain sense you're traveling in space and time. But actually most of the planets that we're discovering at the moment are still relatively close to us. If you're talking about tens or hundreds of light years away, which is really nothing in, in cosmological sort of time. And so in a certain sense, although uh, when we're looking at the light of this planet, you're right that in a certain sense we're looking at this planet uh, 10 years ago or 100 uh, years ago, still is, is so close by that in a certain sense we're not too worried about that. So we, we are not able yet to look at galaxies and planets that are so far away that at that point the, the time question is, is important. But it's an it's a absolutely great question. Thank you. Time for one more. Um, are there any planets with a similar atmosphere to Earth? Um, for the moment, we don't yet, we're not yet able really to sound the planets which are similar to the Earth, um, in part because if the planet is small and cold, it's much more difficult to look at the atmosphere. And so for the moment, we were able to do some super Earths, uh, but these super Earths are very hot, in particular 155 Cancri E is orbiting very close to the star, is one of these lava planets. Um, so we need to have more powerful telescope, and that's why we need this new generation in order to look at smaller and colder planets, because current telescopes are really not good enough. Do you think there can be life forms on colder or hotter planets? Yeah, I think we need to be very open-minded here, and so that's why I'm very curious to see about uh, this uh, 
uh, planets around the colder star their own sun. As I said, they're not the Earth twin, they're our cousin. But I think we need to be open-minded about life. Uh, you know, looking for a twin of the Earth is interesting, but you know, maybe it's not the only type of planet that can host life. And so I think we need to be a bit open-minded and try to understand what's going on out there, given the diversity we are seeing. And so it's really just the first step that we're doing. But uh, yes, it's a great suggestion. I would definitely look for um, planets which are not exactly like our Earth, but slightly colder, slightly hotter, slightly different, and we'll see what we'll find out. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your time at the Summer Science Exhibition.